Welcome to Season 5 of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former health commissioner here in Baltimore, Maryland. Our goal with this podcast is to bring scientific evidence and experience to shed light on critical health issues. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, I speak to Dr. Jennifer Nuzzo, Senior Scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. Our topic is the recent release of the updated Global Health Security Index, an inventory and ranking of the world's preparedness for pandemics. Let's listen. Dr. Nuzzo, thanks so much for coming back to Public Health on Call to talk about the Global Health Security Index. Now, when we last heard about this, it was 2020 and people were talking about the 2019 index. Yes, it was. We published the 2019 index in October of 2019. So just a few months before the pandemic. And in that index and the report that we issued, um, we concluded that no country was fully prepared for a pandemic. Um, It's a conclusion um, that uh, was a hard one to say at the time, um, but unfortunately, I think became true as we would see uh, several months later. And the concept behind the index is to look at every country for their preparedness across a whole bunch of different dimensions. Yes, the index is really a benchmarking tool. Um, So what we're trying to do is um, take a look at what capacities, both in the public health side as well as healthcare, uh, countries have to be able to use um, in responding to a serious infectious disease emergency like a pandemic, as well as um, some other factors like their risk environment, their political situation, their economic situation, environmental situation, things that could influence, to some extent, their ability to use the capacities they have. Um, so it's really probably best thought of as an inventory rather than a model. We're not trying to make predictions about how well countries will do, just try to see what they have and what the context is in which they'll be responding um, so that we can understand going in where there are gaps that need to be addressed, maybe where there are parts of the world where there are risks that need to be mitigated, and really to judge when events first happen, you know, what what are the the, the resources available to be able to respond or do external need, resources need to be brought in. So you released the 2019 report, turns out to be right before a pandemic. And now you've got a 2021 report. It's not the same inventory. You've learned some things during the pandemic. Yes, we have. Um, We are fortunate enough to be advised by an international panel of experts. And um, as we were getting together to put together the 2021 index, we um, brought our panel together to review our index framework, all the questions that we ask for each country, and to see, you know, what did we miss? What about COVID is not reflected in this index? Are there things that are included that shouldn't be, et cetera? And we got a lot of great feedback and we realized there are some capacities that weren't initially included in the 2019 uh, index that have since been added. Could you give a couple examples? Sure. So we actually didn't have contact tracing and the ability to do contact tracing um, in the 2019 index. Um, So that was something that we looked at as well as not just the ability to do it, but also the ability to support people who may need to quarantine at home or isolate because they're sick, whether they're financial support mechanisms or social support mechanisms for people. Those are some of the the capacities we added on on the public health side. We also looked at other sort of risk uh, environment factors. So one of the things that we have seen is that the political dimension of this response has been incredibly important. Countries that have had a lot of capacities like the United States um, have chosen not to use those capacities. So we wanted to see if there was a way we could update the index to reflect those political dimensions. Um, It's a little bit tough because uh, when you have any political leader in power, that's not an inherent trait of a country that can change over the course of time. And so we have to pick things that can are a little bit more that you can monitor for a longer period of time that aren't tied to particular um, people. So we looked at things like um, trust in science, trust in advice from medical providers, other additional dimensions that we could add um, to countries to understand that kind of social political element of the response um, that we didn't have in there before. Now, part of the report is a ranking. And um, I'd like you to kind of 
talk that through a little bit. Like, what's the purpose of doing a ranking and which countries have come up as kind of high on this inventory scale? Yeah, so the index awards points to all countries. And based on the uh, scores that countries get, um, they are then ranked. We really don't emphasize the ranking as much. Um, it was probably a bigger issue in the first index. It's um, it's common in indices for there to be rankings, but um, we've always tried to, to not emphasize the rankings, um, in part because we very much view the index as something that's scored on an absolute scale. So just because you have a few points higher than a country doesn't mean that your country is going to do that much better. Any missing capacity, any missing element could be what's crippling. And so if no country has 100, (laughs) and in this index, no country scored in the top tier, um, then it's safe to conclude that no country is fully prepared for the events that we're looking at. And in fact, this latest index still finds very serious caps affecting all countries. Absolutely. Um, One area where we continue to see very serious gaps, and this was the biggest finding in the 2019 index, was that healthcare is really the kind of the weakest link in preparedness in many countries. Uh, We saw that very clearly in the 2019 index. Um, Our healthcare capacity category is still a place where many countries lose a lot of points. And if you know anything about um, global health security, it shouldn't be surprising because much of the effort that's gone on at the global and also the national level to improve readiness for epidemics and pandemics has really tended to focus on public health, things that are the purview of ministries of health that can be implemented sort of at the community level and not necessarily fully engaging of of health facilities and um, health system strengthening programs. There's really been a a historical divide between global health security efforts and health system strengthening efforts. Um, And that became clear when we were scoring countries um, where they may have, you know, excellent uh, public health laboratories, but insufficient healthcare provision to be able to you know, obtain the specimens that would then get sent to those laboratories. So really the kind of foundation of, of global health security we view as, as healthcare capacities has historically been missing from efforts to push countries to improve their readiness for pandemics. And we hope COVID changes that. Sounds like you need both. You need strong public health capacities. You need a good healthcare system. In the United States, we have very, you know, strong healthcare system in many ways, but we have had some very haphazard and weak public health capacities. It's true. You need both. Healthcare is, you know, foundational for those public health capacities in many ways. And, and, you know, in the United States, we do have strengths, but there are also places where we have weaknesses. And that was something that we saw also in 2019 was that, you know, the United States has a very modern and advanced health um, care, but we don't have guaranteed access to free care. People still, uh, you know, have to think about the cost of healthcare and that may deter them from, you know, going to get a prompt diagnosis, uh, you know, getting tested (laughs) for COVID. It's something that we're seeing right now. So that was a place where we saw some warning signs for the U.S. Yeah, excellent point. So um, maybe just last question on how you hope people use this index as well as maybe how not to use the index. And maybe we'll start with how not to use the index. And I have an image in my mind. You probably know what image I'm talking about, but President Trump holding up the report and saying, Basically, uh, we've got this. Don't worry, America. Yes, that's very much not the way to use the index um, because unfortunately, no country has got this right now. And um, what we have seen is that countries have made improvements through COVID, um, but it's not clear that those improvements that they've made are actually going to last beyond the current crisis. So we hope that at the core, people use this index to see where we are as a world right now, given the historic moment that we're in, how have we made some changes, and how can we sustain those changes so that we don't let them just erode after this crisis as we have historically done, such that when we find ourselves in yet another crisis, we have to scramble once again to try to put capacities into place. And are there countries that are using the index in the way that you hope? So um, we were very heartened to learn that um, prior to COVID-19, New Zealand saw its scores in the index and reflected uh, upon it and used it as a as a moment to um, examine where their weaknesses are. You know, the index is a tool. We provide the information. Countries, um, you know, should use that information to decide how much of it tracks with their own understanding of, of what's happening and then to, to 
have a conversation about what, if anything, they should be changing. Um, New Zealand did that, and they actually credited the index as sort of saving them in advance of COVID-19 because it exposed places that they hadn't anticipated as being weaknesses, or at least prompted a conversation about some changes that needed to be made such that when the pandemic hit, they could, you know, go into it fully understanding where their strengths and weaknesses were. Well, I hope uh, the index is widely used for that purpose. Thank you so much um, for all that you've done for this and so many other aspects of the pandemic response. You know, you're leaving Johns Hopkins for Brown University uh, for a big job there, but uh, we wish you well and we, we hope you'll come back on the podcast. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and I'd always love to. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker, Matthew Martin, Spencer Greer, and Holly Cardinal, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media support from Grace Holes-Fernandez. Thank you for listening. Thank you.